My name is Michelle Anduele, and I'm the Senior Director for Health Promotion with the Arthritis Foundation. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Renuka Nayak and Dr. Julia Manassan. Dr. Nayak is a rheumatologist and a microbiome researcher at the University of California at San Francisco. She has a unique background in biology, computer science, and clinical rheumatology. And this serves as a foundation for her research on the role of the human gut microbiome in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and other rheumatic diseases. Dr. Julia Manassan is also a rheumatologist, but she's at NYU Langone Medical Center and an instructor in the Department of Medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. She has an active clinical trial on the role of microbiome in psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. Welcome. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. So, Dr. Nayak, let's start with you. So terms like microbiome, microbes, microbial balance, gut and microbiome are used interchangeably. Could you uh, do some clarification for patient community around those terms? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So of course, in the media, a lot of people have heard about the microbiome, but what is it actually? Um, and among researchers like myself, we kind of uh, like to distinguish between the microbes. Um, and that's kind of a general term for a, um, several different types of microorganisms. And that includes bacteria, fungi, archaea, and viruses. Um, most microbiome researchers usually study bacteria and fungi because right now those are the tools that we have that are um, able to look at those communities of bacteria and fungi. But we should also keep in mind that we're starting to learn about these other types of microorganisms as well, such as viruses um, and archaea. Um, and so that's microbe or microorganism. Now, a lot of times we're, you know, these organisms, they don't exist kind of one by themselves. They're kind of in a community. So when we're talking about communities of microorganisms, um, we're talking about microbiota. Um, and there are microbiota, microbial communities everywhere, like in the soil, um, in the ocean. But for physicians and patients, the one that we kind of focus on are the microbiota, the microbial communities that exist in and on us because they have the power to shape our health and well-being. Um, and so those are microbial communities. Now, the other term that probably is the most popular is microbiome. And when we, we talk about microbiome, we're talking about not just these microorganisms, but also the genes that they bring with them, because those genes are the things that produce the compounds that then affect a patient's health or well-being. And so um, just like our genome is the collection of all the genes in our cells, our microbiome is the collection of both the microorganisms and the genes they bring with them. And so, you know, those are probably some common terms that, um, you know, patients have come across. One of the things that's used a lot, I think, in the literature is dysbiosis or microbial balance. Um, and I think those terms are a little bit harder to define. You know, if you kind of ask a researcher, what does dysbiosis mean? Um, it's usually like they say that it's when a microbiome community looks different than another microbiome community or different from a healthy person's microbiome. But whether that's good or bad, we don't really know. And so, you know, the term dysbiosis connotes kind of a bad thing, but we don't know, are those microorganisms that exist in a dysbiotic community, are they actually helping patients that are diseased, right? Like, is it a compensatory response or is it actually a disease causing response? And that's really hard to know because of where we are in our field. Um, and so, you know, people who really study the microbiome, we don't use those terms like dysbiosis because we don't actually know how to precisely define that. But it is something that comes up, you know, up a lot in the literature. And it's really just, I think, meant to connote or denote that um, you know, the microbiomes of patients really does look different the, from uh, compared to those of healthy controls. But why that is, we really don't know, you know. So is it correct? Because a lot of people use gut and microbiome interchangeably, but it sounds as if there's a microbiome in the gut, there's microbiome mm -hmm. in our skin, we probably have oral microbiome. Would that be correct? Exactly. And each one of those locations um, harbors a unique microbial community composition. So the microbiome in the, the oral microbiome looks very different than the gut microbiome looks very different than the skin microbiome. And that's because the environments in each of those locations is different. And so the microbes that exist in each of those locations is different. Um, I would say probably a lot of, um, investigators that look at patient microbiomes tend to focus on the gut microbiome because that is the most abundant, uh, microbial resources 
uh, resource. They're the most number of microbes in the gut. Um, and also that kind of sample, um, well, I mean, I guess they're all easy to collect the skin and the oral and the gut microbiome, but yeah, most of the, most of the research that I know thus far has really focused on the gut microbiome. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, Lesson, let's talk about some of that research because you have done extensive research. That's one of your clinical trials for PSA, for RA, for the spondylarthropathies, PSA and AXPA. So let's talk a little bit about some of your work. Yeah, um, I, before I do that, I just wanted to add to Dr. Nayak as well. Um, part of the reason that there's there are also a lot of studies in the gut microbiome is also because there are so many microbes, as she mentioned, um, that in some ways it, it's easier to study because it's not as prone to um, certain conditions in the lab. Um, when you study the skin microbiome, for instance, it's a lot harder because there are fewer microbes there. So it might be um, more difficult to study because of contamination and, and, and things like that. So people really do focus on, on the gut a little bit more. Um, but we, um, we, we've studied um, in, in our lab, I work with Dr. Jose Cher, um, and we've done a lot of studies both on rheumatoid arthritis, um, on reactive arthritis, on spondyl arthritis, psoriatic arthritis and, and psoriasis. Um, and we've actually looked at um, a lot of the different um, environments that, we, that Dr. Nyag had mentioned. So, we, so there's been studies on the oral microbiome, uh, particularly in rheumatoid arthritis um, in the gut as well. And there have been certain bugs that have been identified or I should say bacteria in particular um, that have been associated um, with rheumatoid arthritis, both in oral and, and, and gut microbes. Um, and um, so people have sort of studied these particular uh, bacteria and, and have sort of started to look further to see if um, these bacteria have associations with say um, certain antibodies that occur in the blood. And there have, have been studies like that found in RA. So there, um, we've, we haven't just identified the, the specific bacteria, we're starting to identify maybe mechanisms of how, of how they work. Um, and in, um, in psoriatic disease right now, um, there are quite a few papers on, um, on specifically on psoriasis um, and looking at the skin microbiome, um, but our group has started to, um, to also look at psoriatic arthritis. Um, separately from just psoriasis and comparing and seeing whether there are differences as you go um, throughout the, the whole spectrum, going from healthy to having psoriasis to having psoriatic arthritis. Um, and the study that you've actually referred to that we're currently doing is, is um, looking at identical twins um, who have um, one will have uh, psoriatic disease, either psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, um, and one who uh, does not have either of those and is um, comparatively healthy. Um, and the reason we're interested in that is because um, we wanna see if there are specific changes that might be associated with having disease that are independent of having um, a genetic predis predisposition to having psoriatic disease. So we're trying to look at people who have the same genes, but one gets the disease and one does not, um, thinking about how um, you know, whether the, the microbes might be protective of the person who doesn't get the disease, whatever microbes they have, or vice versa, the people who do get disease, whether those microbes might be um, related to actually pushing them to, to, towards that spectrum of having disease. Um, so we're, we're still in the preliminary stages of that, but it's, um, uh, we're, you know, at, at the process of collecting more data about it and trying to kind of look both on in the skin and in the gut as well and putting that together. Oh, good. So is it fair to say that at this stage, we're not clear how much of microbiome balance determines your likelihood to get a disease versus how much your disease worsens your microbiome balance? I, yeah, I, th I think at this stage, you know, the field is sort of moving in a direction of trying to figure out um, what is the cause and effect. But right now, most of the studies we have, we can't really tell whether the changes you have when you have disease are um, because of the disease or whether you had the changes beforehand that may have pushed you to, to get the disease. So we don't really know which, which way it went first. Um, and that's kind of where the field is trying to move to. Okay. That's very helpful. So Dr. Nayak, let's talk a little bit about some of the disease modifying medications. I know that there's an impact on the microbiome of their clinical response. 
So could you talk about some of your work there? I know some of it has been funded by the Arthritis Foundation. Yes, yes, absolutely. I will also just, um, you know, I think this is the the question that you actually addressed um, to Dr. Manass, and I just want to add that, you know, I think in patients, it's really hard to know that cause effect because a lot of studies are kind of these snapshot cross-sectional studies looking at one moment in time. Um, you know, and I, and I think one of the ways that we're going to kind of look at some of these relationship is with these longitudinal data sets where we're following patients and their microbiomes over time. So I think that'll be really interesting. Um, but one of the sort of, um, you know, I, I think there is a little bit of evidence to suggest that the microbiome plays a role um, because some of our treatments actually are antibiotic treatments like minocycline or have antibiotic properties like sulfasalazine. And that kind of, um, that was actually one of the sort of focuses of my research looking at methotrexate. Um, we found that also methotrexate, even though it was designed to target host cells like human cells, it actually has these off-target effects on the microbiome. And we think that that's important because one of the really cool, like there's two really cool aspects of the microbiome um, that I wanna highlight that I don't think we had a chance to touch them on yet. First is that each person's microbiome is very personalized, almost like your genome. Um, and so there's a lot of variation across people, and that may explain some of the variation that we see in how patients respond to therapies. So methotrexate is one of them. Some people do really well with that drug. Other people really don't. So why is that? And we haven't been able to find, you know, a good reason. We've looked at the host genome. You know, we've looked at the human genome. We tried to find other ways to predict methotrexate response, but we haven't been able to. And um, one of the sort of... Um, questions that our group asked, along with Dr. Jose Scher, um, who is a close collaborator of mine, is that we wanted to know whether the microbiome could predict patient response to methotrexate. Um, and we found that it could. Um, and so why is that? So there are basically two major mechanisms that I want to highlight um, by which the microbiome may impact the response to DMARDs. First is that our microbiome, it's highly personalized and it does a lot of stuff for us actually. So we rely on our microbiome to digest the nutrients that we eat. Those same enzymes, which we don't have, you know, and we rely on our microbiome to do that for us. Those same enzymes can accidentally metabolize the drugs that we give to our patients. And so that was, we actually found evidence for that, that our gut, human gut microbes can metabolize methotrexate. And that is um, inversely associated with how patients respond to the drug. So for example, is it the case that, you know, if I have a patient that comes into my clinic and I give them methotrexate and they don't respond, is it because their gut my bacteria are metabolizing methotrexate? And we have some evidence to suggest that that's, suggest that that's true. And now we're kind of doing um, more human-based studies looking at levels of methotrexate in people and how that's associated with um, my, their microbiome composition. So I think that that's a really cool mechanism. The other kind of major um, cool thing about the microbiome that I wanted to highlight is that the microbiome can very strongly influence the host's immune system. And as we all know in rheumatology, like most of our diseases are because of abnormal immune responses, right? And so what is the role of the microbiome in triggering either aberrant inflammation or quelling some of that? Um, and so while it's hard to know that the answer to that question using human studies, we actually do have studies from mice that suggest that um, certain specific microbes can trigger inflammation and can worsen autoimmunity. Um, and also the is too, there are some microbes that are kind of the good guys, um, in the sense that they can quell or they're, you know, the things that they make can quell inflammation. And I think that that's, you know, one of the reasons we think about probiotics. Um, so with keeping that in mind, you know, the other mechanism by which the microbiome can influence the response to DMARDs is that some of our DMARDs like methotrexate can act on the microbiome. And it may be the case that by acting on the microbiome, methotrexate exerts some of its anti-inflammatory effects by making the microbiome less inflammatory. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, you know, that both, the, you know, the, that I kind of have the, this phrase that the bugs can affect the drugs, the microbiome can affect drug pharmacology, either metabolism and for other drugs can affect absorption, but also that bugs, um, uh, so, so bugs can affect drugs, but also that drugs like methotrexate can affect bugs, um, mm -hmm. and can mediate some of the anti-inflammatory effects. And so, you know, I, I think that, um, those are at least two mechanisms. And I will say that this is all very, it's still kind of in its early stages and we're kind of working out 
you know, what is the mechanism by which methotrexate may act on the microbiome to reduce inflammation? What are the mechanisms by which bacteria metabolize um, drugs like methotrexate? All of that is still in its early stages, but we're just now starting to, I think, uh, appreciate the fact that the microbiome plays a role in the response to drugs that we give to our patients. And we really hadn't thought about this possibility, I think in rheumatology until like this moment in time, which I think is very exciting, but there's still a lot to learn. Okay. So Dr. Manasson, I know it sounds as if there's a lot of collaboration between your team and, and Dr. Nayak's team in California. So I like the cross coast collaboration. And as a patient, I thank you both for this. <laughs> um, but is there any um, work around biologics or is a lot of focus on traditional DMART? Um, no, we've started to, to look at biologics as well. Um, I, I mean, I, th I think at drugs in general, um, there was a study that um, and, and our group did actually looking at um, trying to see what happens to the microbiome longitudinally, uh, meaning, uh, you know, from one point to another, um, while taking certain biologic agents um, that are uh, used in psoriatic disease. Um, and we found that, you know, that there are changes um, depending on the type of biologic that, that you're using. Um, and we, we actually looked at not just the, um, the bacteria, which is, which is what a lot of studies focus on, but also on, on the fungal, um, organisms as well, um, and found that there, there are some changes that, that can, can occur there. Um, and, and so it, I think it is important, like Dr. Nayak mentioned to just to, to really, um, look at the, the whole big picture because it, it, it's almost like a um, somewhat circular, you know, the bugs can affect the drugs and the drugs can affect the bugs. And it sort of, you know, goes back and forth um, and very in, somewhat complex mechanism, but that we're just starting to, um, to try to figure out. Um, but I think um, it's a really important direction to, to continue researching because, um, I, you know, I think this may get us to a point where someone, a patient comes into the clinic um, and instead of uh, doing a trial and saying, okay, let's try you on methotrexate and then wait for three months and see what the ultimate response is, um, perhaps we'll get to a point where we can even sample um, their microbiome and then say, well, I, I think methotrexate, you know, is not the best choice for you because I don't think you will respond to it as well as, you know, to something else. Okay. Um, we're definitely not there yet, but that would be uh, one of the goals of doing this kind of research is to getting to this point where we, we can actually do more personalized medicine um, and, and pick the type of medicine for, for each, each patient, depending on you know, what, what their organism is like and what, what bugs they have. Okay. So Dr. Nayak, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to look into the crystal ball <laughs> <laughs> as a patient and I'm in my mid fifties. So are we a decade away from what Dr. Manasson mentioned or even longer? And I, is there any difference for someone newly diagnosed today um, that some of these learnings can uh, impact right away? Um, I am kind of hopeful that, you know, that we are going to start to see some of these um, tools used in the clinic sooner rather than later. And that's in part because, um, you know, I, before I did this work on the microbiome, my previous research was looking at the human genome. And what I love about studying microbes is that they're, you know, they're, they, you can grow them, you can manipulate them, you can do so many more things, you can change their genomes um, in, in ways that it's much harder to do when you're talking about the human, you know, human cells and human genome. And so I actually think that right now there are, you know, outside of academia and industry, there's so many companies and so much money that's being poured into addressing these types of questions, you know, personalizing medicine, developing microbiome targeted tools. And I think that that's because in academia and outside of academia, we appreciate the fact that we can do things a lot faster um, when we're studying the microbiome as opposed to trying to manipulate human, the human genome or human cells or the human immune system. That being said, you know, I will say that there's still so much to learn. Like we don't know what half of the genes in the human microbiome do. We don't know what you know, a majority of the metabolites that they produce that can affect the host, we don't know what they do either. So there's so much that's unknown um, still. And so that's why it's actually kind of hard. I think in this day today, you know, I would have a hard time telling a patient the, the proper, you know, like a specific diet or specific probiotic, because there's still so much that we don't know. But I think I'm really, I'm hopeful that like in the next 10 years or 20 years that 
we will have microbiome directed therapies or diagnostic tools or prognostic tools for use in, um, in the rheumatology clinic. Okay. Dr. Manasson, did you want to add something before I move on? No, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with Dr. Nayak. I'm also hopeful for the future that, you know, we'll get to a point where we'll be able to have this as a, as a real tool in the clinic. Um, and, and things are also in terms of technology becoming easier and easier. I think earlier on, it was, a, you know, it was a lot harder to study the microbiome, but now we have these amazing sequencing technologies and things are just cheaper and faster. And so hopefully we'll get it, you know, into the clinic soon. Okay. So that's the news. So thank you for that. So um, my last question is, or kind of what can patients do in the interim? And so um, I'll start with you, Dr. Nayak, any guidance around prebiotic foods? What impact do they really have? And what guidance could you give patients around prebiotics? Yeah, we, I, I would say there's um, just a few very small studies looking at pre and um, probiotics. Um, and so probiotics, I'll just say these are, you know, um, therapies, I guess, or foods or something that have live organisms, live bacteria that you ingest. And the idea is that that those live bacteria will affect your gut microbiome and potentially affect um, uh, your disease. So that's a probiotic. And then prebiotic is, you know, um, it's kind of compounds or nutrients that will foster the development of probiotics, of live bacteria that potentially has a beneficial effect to the host. Um, so just that's a little bit of um, terminology. But um, there are very few and small studies looking at the effects of pre and probiotics in patients with rheumatic disease. And um, I would say I'm, I'm happy that some of them show a positive response. There's a reduction of symptoms and a reduction of tender and swollen joint counts. And usually these are studies of like 50 people all at a single institution. So whether that those studies kind of generalize to broader populations, I think is hard to say. And um, the major caveat with uh, pre or, or probiotics is that when you go to the store or if you guys try and find something on Amazon, um, you don't actually know like what is in those bottles because pre and probiotics are kind of not regulated in the same way that methotrexate or etanercept or other drugs are, are regulated. Um, and so I actually don't uh, recommend for my patients to be on pre or probiotics because I don't know what I'm telling them to take. Um, and so I would say that, you know, the guidance that I give to my patients at this moment in time is to eat a healthy diet. Um, and so that means like, you know, foods that are low and processed or um, yeah, foods that are not very highly processed or high sugar um, to eat lots of fruits and vegetables and whole foods. Um, but I will say that I think we're just, most of the studies looking at diet and the impact of diet on the microbiome has been done in healthy populations or in patients with specific diseases like IBD. We're only now starting to learn, I think the effects of diet, diet and probiotics and prebiotics on patients with rheumatic disease. And um, I think I kind of said earlier on that uh, patients with rheumatic disease, they do have a different microbiome than those of healthy controls. And so it's important to kind of look at that relationship specifically in patients with rheumatic disease. We don't have a lot of that really good data at this point. So I would say um, for patients, um, if you have a chance to participate in these kinds of studies, please, you know, help us because that's really advancing the field. Um, and, you know, we'll just kind of get that information hopefully over the next several years about what is the role of diet or probiotics on the microbiome and how can we leverage that to reduce inflammation and treat disease or ideally even prevent disease from starting in the first place. Okay. Dr. Manasson, any thoughts on kind of the skin microbiome for people with psoriatic arthritis? Any do's and don'ts around skin products or things that they should be cognizant of? Um, I think kind of in agreement with Dr. Nayak, we, I don't think we really know what, you know, about specific microbes for, for the skin. And we're just starting to sort of um, find out what, that, that there are differences, there are differences in diversity, but I, I can't say exactly, you know, which bugs are causing um, people to, to have skin conditions like psoriasis um, or, you know, in, in psoriatic arthritis, whether, um, which ones may affect that. Um, but, but I think, you know, keeping a healthy microbiome is certainly important. Um, aside from using prebiotics or probiotics, the other thing that I think is also important is to 
if you do have a healthy microbiome to sort of keep it that way and not use antibiotics when it's not necessary. Um, so that's sort of kind of the other component of it um, is it's sort of, you know, trying to just um, keep up the diversity there because that seems to, to be uh, uh, something that shows up over and over in, in various um, uh, rheumatic diseases. Um, but yeah, at this point, I think we're still kind of in, in the more discovery phase um, and, and not even just identifying specific uh, microbes, but also their interactions and how um, it may be, you know, not the specific microbes, but also how they interact with one another that may be um, contributing to disease or contributing to how people respond to drugs, et cetera. So. Well, Dr. Manassan and Dr. Nayak, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.